the sheep shed. A place of new beginnings. Presenting Dr. Mac Evans. Pastor Jeremy, as he comes to bring the word. We're going to go a little personal today. We haven't gotten real personal in a little while. We're going to try to bring things from a point of view that maybe some people don't see it from this point of view. This might be hard on some people to hear. I'm going to do the best I can to try to see if I can get you to see it from another point of view without messing it up or bringing any confusion. I'm going to read a story out of Joshua in chapter 3. I'm going to start at verse 1 where it says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning. And they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all of the children of Israel. And they lodged there before they crossed over. And so it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people, saying, That when you see the ark of the covenant of your Lord God, and the priests that are bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Say, go after it. Go Yet, there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go, because you have not passed this way before. Say, uncharted territory. Uncharted territory. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders amongst you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, I will be with you. In this story, they're connecting their roots, their past, and their future is all colliding at one time. And this word is telling them that they're about to go over. And they've never been there before. Never been there before. But it's also telling them that I'm going to show you that as I was with your fathers, I will also be with you. I believe that there is a coming together of some things that we have had in the past and some things that we have never had before. And one of the first things that we find out in this story is that a man named Joshua has been chosen by God to lead. And what I believe that qualified Joshua to be God's choice was because he loved God's glory. See, when Moses would go into the tent to meet, see, the tabernacle wasn't built yet. And they're all out here alone, so they built this tent, and Moses would meet in this tent, and the glory of God was so powerful that you could actually see it in a smoke. The Bible says it looked like a smoke. The glory was so thick. And Moses would meet in this tent with people and meet in here to meet with the Lord in this tent. But Joshua, he stayed outside the tent and lingered in the glory of the Lord. He knew it was there and he lingered around the glory of God. 
until he proves to God that he was a man that loved God's glory. And so God gave him his hand of authority and gave it to this man who loved the glory of God because that's what he was in love with. He was in love with the glory. I believe that we are in a transition in the kingdom of God. And everybody kind of knows it in a way. You can watch it on Facebook. You can get on TikTok. Every soothsayer, every witch, spiritualism person, everybody knows it and they're all proclaiming that something is starting to happen. They're calling it frequencies. They're calling it all different types of sensitivities and levels and layers. Call it what you want. But the glory is beginning to drip. And everybody knows it. Even the unbelievers. The Word said it would pour out on all mankind, not just the believers. Come on, yes. But the believers are the ones that should know what to do with it. But I do believe there is a transition that is taking place. And God is going to give great authority and influence to men who have proved that they love the glory of God. They have got to stop loving the glory of men and start loving the glory of God. They have got to stop being influenced by people. And they have got to start rehearsing in their hearts again the drive to let the love affair of God produce in them a true honor for the presence of God. Now I want to take just a moment and I want to attempt to explain the difference between three things. Number one, the anointing. Number two, the presence. And number three, the glory. See, when somebody moves in the anointing, if people will be receptive to what that anointing is trying to produce in their lives, what it'll do is it'll end up opening them up to the manifest presence of God. But, there's even a difference between the manifest presence of God and the glory of God. It is not the same thing. See, you can be in the presence of God and appreciate the presence of God. But it's when you get in the glory of God that things really begin to change. See, in the glory of God, there is revelation. In the glory, there are supernatural encounters that bring insight into the enemy's camp that exposes his plan of attack. Things that you never knew that was laid siege on you and your family. You never knew what it was. In the glory of God, you can see it. It exposes the enemy's camp in your family and in your life. It exposes the plan of attack that's kept you stuck, walled, and drawing lines with one another. And you don't even know why they're there. The glory of God exposes those things. In the glory comes strategies. Because once you see the enemy's strategy, you start formulating your own. Why? You love your family. And you love the glory of God. In the glory, there is a depth of God's presence that has taken over the entire atmosphere at that moment to bring about change. What kind of change? to advance the kingdom, that kind of change. See, the anointing of God comes through an individual. An individual that God has touched to perform a specific deed on His behalf. The level at which a person or a people can receive or honor, not respect, honor the anointing that this individual is operating under 
will then determine whether they get to step into the presence of God. And the level at which they receive and honor and celebrate the presence of God will determine if they're going to move into the glory. And the level at which they discern and honor and celebrate the glory of God will determine the influence He puts upon them as a people to cause His kingdom to be advanced. Which is what's supposed to be in your heart first, in the first place, is to seek ye first. If that is not what you've been doing, then this isn't going to mean anything to you. This is just drops of water on the ground that you can't hear. See, the anointing will come in. And you can feel it. Some of you feel it right now. And you can experience the anointing. And how you respond to that determines whether you experience the presence of God. And you'll know whether you've moved from the anointing to the presence based on whether you are mesmerized by the individual or the God who sent the individual. See, if you stay in an anointing chaser, you will always be moved by the personality of the person with the anointing. But if you understand that the anointing is not there to cause you to become intoxicated by the individual with the anointing, it was there to make changes in your heart so that you can say yes to the presence of God. Why, Jeremy? Why? Because God knows how dangerous it is for you to experience His presence if you have not allowed the anointing to come and destroy the yoke off of you that is keeping you from being pliable in that moment. See, when you find a person, a church, a people, or a group of leaders that know how to properly maneuver in the presence of God, the presence of God will begin to mature into the glory of God. And I know some people have actually been in some glory meetings. You've experienced it before. Not everybody, but some. See, when you get in one of those glory moments, it doesn't really matter what anybody does anymore. Or what they're singing or how good a singer they are, or what time you have to be at work in the morning. It doesn't matter that your hair's messed up, you got snot running down your face, you got tears and mascara mixed up, dripping off your chin, and you can't find one of your shoes. See, none of that matters. Why? Because God came to get some glory. That's why. Hold on. That's why. And you don't even care about anything else. Nothing else matters anymore. But see, authority comes when you step out of the glory and God says, I've found somebody that's in it for me. Not themselves. They're in it for me. And of all the people that God could have picked, He picked Joshua. Because he had proven himself that even when Moses went out of the tent and away from the glory, he said, I'm just going to hang around out here outside this tent in the glory just to make sure that I don't miss anything. That was Joshua. Do some of you all remember a time in your walk with Christ when you was a glory junkie? Oh, I've heard the stories. Glory junkies. You'd lay down everything in your life for that next fix. That you have no control of when you're going to get it or how much of it. But you knew that getting in the glory was going to cost you something and you was willing to lay everything down for the Lord. Why? To get your next fix of what? His glory. Why? Because it's something like you have never experienced before. Can't live without it. You're a junkie. You're a junkie. 
can't help but think about what's coming. You start planning your marriage, kids, everybody knows that you're getting ready for your next fix. Why? Because they see you laying your life down. Sacrificing, serving, giving, praying. So do you really remember those times in the past where the presence of God was the most important thing in your life? I mean before you learned how to do church. You remember when you just burned for His presence? All right, everybody take a deep breath. Can I take a deep breath? <sighs> kind of quiet in here. I may have to turn the music back on. I know this ain't a, ain't a get excited thing, but this is not what this is for. It's not what this message is for. It's going to come a time in the future where some of you all are going to be facing this crossing over experience into some things that you've never thought you would be, that you didn't even know you could do. You didn't know it was a place. And you're going to be afraid and you're going to be in conflict about that transition. And I want you to remember this message when it comes. You're going to need some things to hold on to when you are facing some uncertain times of transition in your life. I'm hoping you'll remember this and that you're going to be okay. And you need to remember to seek ye first the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom. See, I had a real, man, I had real trouble with my relationship with the Lord growing up. Me and him was just not getting along. I don't know what his problem was. <laughs> I did. I, I gave her everything I got, and I, I was getting in worse shape. And I was like, man, this really feels like a one-sided relationship with you, Lord. I, mean, I, I'm, I don't know. Can I just talk to you? Felt one-sided. Of course, I had all kinds of strongholds in my life, and the voice of the Lord was all filtered with condemnation and fear and guilt and rejection and oppression and discouragement and confusion and everything else I could think of. It was all mixed up. So, of course, when the Lord spoke, it was always coming through a, a lens that sowed more confusion and more oppression into my life. I don't know if that makes any sense to some people, but my relationship with the Lord kind of stunk. And I was going downhill and got down pretty low, but you know, my dad preached a pretty solid gospel of the kingdom. And I... I, I, I I know, it's like, well, Jeremy, he died on the cross and you get to go live in eternity forever. And that should just make you excited. I'm like, yeah, that makes me excited. And then I'm like, well, yeah, but okay, well, now that excitement's over. This kind of sucks. <laughs> I mean, what's, you know, you got anything else to offer in this relationship? Where's this two-way thing at? It just, just feels like a one-sided deal. And I really had trouble with it. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not very relational, so I'm sure I had some problems. But um, so I fell in love with the kingdom. I know that sounds confusing. I fell in love with the kingdom. I listened to every sermon tape. I, I quit a job and threw a paper route so I could listen to two sermon tapes seven days a week. Throwing papers from four to seven o'clock every day. Because I wanted to listen. I was, I was hungry. I wanted to hear the kingdom. The kingdom, I was in love with it. There was something about it. It was the only thing I had interest in. And uh, so this loving relationship I had with the kingdom, I didn't know it would bring full circle that it was actually the king I was in love with. See, the kingdom of God is nothing but His personality in a way. Wow. It's His relationship requirements to have a relationship with Him. It, you can't have a relationship with somebody if you ain't talking to them. You, 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 everybody seems to think that the Lord has just got this relationship with you that no matter what you do, He's just going to stay close to you. Really? Do that to your wife and tell me that. You think God's any different? You think that if you're a moron and keep acting like one because you don't really want anything to do with him, but you expect something out of him in return that he's going to give it to you? It's a relationship. And he has requirements. And I didn't realize that the whole time I was learning about the kingdom, I was really learning about the man that I didn't like was Jesus. I didn't like him because his relationship sucked. To me, it did. I had trouble with it. So I fell in love with the kingdom and found out it was him. Took me full circle and he led me right back to him. Everything leads back to Jesus. Yes. Everything. Yes. Everything. Yes. I want to take a minute to just look at Joshua because I'm just about done. I want you all to understand something about Joshua. Joshua was a bad dude, okay? He wasn't some little, whoo, he was a bad dude. He was getting ready for battle. 
And he goes over to Jericho to survey the land, get some strategy, get some understanding of the terrain, whatever it is he needs to do, because they've got a fight coming. And while he was over there, he was confronted with a man that was standing there next to him with a sword already drawn. So Joshua pulls his sword and says, Are you for us or are you against us? Not knowing that it was the angel of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army that he pulled his sword on. Joshua pulled his sword on the angel of the Lord. I'm sure the angel of the Lord looked at him and thought like, Dude, you ought to be so happy you've been hanging out by that tent in the glory because if you hadn't been, I'd just... I might just slap a hair lip on you. <laughs> now in Joshua 1, God tells Joshua, He says, look, I want you to get up and I want you to go over the Jordan. It's time. It's time. You and all these people to the land in which I'm given to them. Now I don't know if you know this or not. But there are some places you cannot go until you are willing to have the funeral that you have to have in order to get to the next level. Some things are going to have to die whether you want it to or not. I don't care if it's friends, family, you, it doesn't matter, habit, it doesn't matter. There are some funerals that you are just going to have to have before you get to go over. Some people are just unwilling to let some things die in their life. Now, I know you don't want to hear that. I know you don't. I know you don't want to hear it, but you better get this revelation. God told a man, Moses, to speak to the rock. The rock that watered all of Israel. Told him to speak to it to make the water come out. And out of frustration, Moses struck the rock. And just because he did that, and he didn't do it God's way, he lost his privilege to go into Canaan. This is Moses. This is Moses. This ain't just some dude. This is Moses. And he just went through all of these events. Now apparently if he was having to speak to the rock, apparently it didn't just run 24 hours a day, 7 days a week for the people to drink. Apparently it ran at times and didn't run at times and he spoke to the rock for it to run when it was time. Well can you imagine 2 or 3 million people? You don't just get to go to the sink and get a drink when you want. People are griping and complaining and murmuring and blah, like we do. God, I can have a revelation from the Lord that will set my life on a new course. Two weeks later I'm griping about something else. It's our, it's our nature to complain. These people were complaining by the millions. And Moses got so frustrated by the overwhelming complaining and griping of the people that have witnessed the most miraculous events in world history. And they're griping about everything. And he gets so frustrated with it, he takes his staff and he strikes the stone that God told him to speak to it. And he didn't get to cross over into the promised land after all that he had done because of that one moment. So God tells Joshua, he says, get up and I want you to go over. Now some of you all have been through some very difficult dying seasons in your life. Lots of us. And you can either die because things are dying around you, and you can stay right there where you bury them. Or you can make up your mind that I'm going all in. And ain't nothing going to stop me. Going forward is what's on my mind. Because I feel a fresh wind blowing of some sort that's giving people the ability to step into the new. Now the next thing that we realize about Israel is that they're camped at a place called the Acacia Grove. Now the Acacia Grove is a place, it's a holding place is what it is. It's where they're held up. It's where they're camped. So when you think about Acacia Grove, it's a holding place. It's where they're waiting. They're sitting. 
It's right before the Jordan River. And it's the Jordan that they need to cross to get into the promised land. The Acacia represents a place of holding. We're not moving backwards, but we're also not moving forward. They're just right there. And the word of the Lord come to tell them that there is a glory. Listen, that there is a glory. And the priests were going to be carrying the cross. They're going to be carrying this glory. And when it passes you by, it's time to leave the holding pattern and go. That's what he told them. This place literally represents process. That's what this place represents. The Jordan represents this final hurdle that Israel must cross before going into the land of Canaan. It's a crossing over place between dimensions. See the Jordan? It stands between prophecy and promise as process. Because it is important that if you are going to grow, that you are going to have to cross over some things. You're going to have to do it. You're going to have to. You have to. You're going to have to cross over. There's going to come a time where you're going to have to get out of your holding pattern. You're going to have to refuse to live in the safety of an encampment that's not bondage. You're not in bondage anymore. But it's also not promise either. We end up finding a spot that we would never have been interested in when we first got touched by God. We end up finding a rhythm called normal. We find a place called life. But the reality is, it's really a place called compromise. I know, I know, and we all say things like, well, at least I'm not on all the drugs and an alcoholic anymore, and I'm not beating my wife, and at least I'm not a gangbanger and doing all those things and lying and manipulating, doing all the things that I used to do. At least I'm not doing all that anymore. Thank God I'm not in Egypt. No, I know we're not in the promised land, but at least we're not in Egypt. Well, let me tell you something. You getting to the place where you're comfortable is not God's ultimate intention for you. And it's still compromise. You doing a little bit better than the people down the road? Or a church that's doing a little bit better than the church up the street? That's not being radical. And I know that if I only had one thing that I was going to be able to say to anybody... is I'd have to say this. There's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. Thank you for joining us. We hope this message has blessed you. You can also receive a full copy of each sermon in CD form by calling 417-825-SHED. And if you're looking for a church home, we would love to see you Sunday at 10 a.m. We're located halfway between Joplin and Neosho on Gateway Drive. The Sheep Shed, where it feels like home. Watch Dr. Mac Evans every Sunday at 7 a.m. on KOEM TV 7, at 7.30 a.m. on KSN TV 16, and at 10.30 p.m. on KODE TV 12. You can also watch each sermon on our YouTube channel, Mac Evans Ministry Team.